and welcome to The Black Room. This is the podcast for all things erotic mind control, and I am your host, Calidus. Welcome back. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been together, and I could regale you with stories of plans and outings and things of that nature, but it's sufficient to say that I have been a little bit busy the past couple of weeks, but I'm very happy to be back now, and I want to start by thanking everyone who has come by the blog to comment or has left their thoughts in email. I appreciate everyone who is listening to the show, spreading word about the show, sharing the show. Thank you very much. It uh, means a lot to me, and I'm very, very pleased to hear that all of you like what you're hearing. So I won't bury the lead. I will say that in this episode, a little bit later, we're going to have the first part of our very first guest appearance here on The Black Room. My good friend, Thrall, otherwise known as A. Regina Cantatus, a very, very talented author, a very, very clever woman, very funny, very bright, and a lot of fun to talk to, as I have had the pleasure of discovering, is going to join me. And I'll be splitting the interview up, I imagine, over this episode and the following episode, as it does run a bit long. And I'm excited to share that with you. It's, it was a very fun conversation, first off, but also I'm eager to have more guests on the show because I think it's very, very fun to talk to people about what they enjoy in the erotic mind control fetish and how they approach what they add to the fetish, the artists and writers and so forth that I do know. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be coming up a bit later in this episode. First guest on the show, hopefully not the last guest. I don't have any more announcements to make, but I'm certainly trading emails with a number of people right now, and hopefully I'll have some more good news to share on that front soon. But for right now, the good news is there's a couple of really great stories going up over at the Erotic Mind Control Story Archive, which, as you probably are aware, but just in case you aren't, you can find by going to mcstories.com. And also, one thing I'll say right at the front, since I am talking about web links, anything that I talk about in the show, I'm going to have links for that in the show's post over on my website. So anywhere that you're listening to this right now, if you want to go and find something that I'm talking about, and I don't happen to give the URL in the recording, you can go to my website, uh, which is for this podcast is podcast dot calidus dash mc dot com you can go to my website and you can check the show notes for this episode there and i'll have all the links that you need to find all of the various things i talk about so just want to say that up front for anyone who might need that piece of information now going back to jukebox if you're not familiar with jukebox's work he's an exceptionally talented writer A very well-disciplined writer, I'll add, also. Jukebox has gone through periods of time where he's uploaded a story a week. He's got great concepts, great characters, always has really hot moments. And as you can imagine, based on his pseudonym, he tends to like song titles for the titles of his stories. It's a very nice bit of cleverness that he always employs. One of my favorite stories from Jukebox's catalog, and and really picking a favorite is not an easy thing to do. He's very, very good. But one of my favorite stories is called What a Girl Wants. It's from 2010, and it continues a, a corner of his mythos that he has revisited a number of times now, and it concerns this either alternate reality or near future continuity where A mysterious company has begun selling these robot, humanoid, I I guess they're more gynoid type sex dolls, these robotic sex dolls that are known as girls, trademark. And I'll give just a minor spoiler warning here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the premise for the story, some of the setup. I won't spill everything, but just a minor spoiler warning. If you don't want to know anything, skip ahead just a minute or so. In What a Girl Wants, there is this fantastic, fantastic scene that we see play out in the story. A woman is making a house call on a friend who has missed a social outing. As I recall, it's a softball game. And 
the, the, the friend called in sick, says, I, I can't play this week, not feeling well. So this woman is making a house call on her friend, bringing her some soup, checking in to see how she's feeling, that sort of thing. Well, it turns out her friend is feeling a little bit better than she let on because her friend has purchased herself a girl. And so this... This good Samaritan character, the, this woman carrying chicken soup or whatever, comes into the apartment expecting to find her friend laid up in bed with a cold or flu or something like that, and instead hears interesting sounds coming from the bedroom and discovers that her friend is apparently become completely obedient to her robotic sex toy. And so she decides she has to do something about this. And so she does. She intervenes. And if you're interested in finding out what happens next, go read the story because it's fantastic. So anyway, I love that story. I love the entire mythos around the girls, trademark. And I was delighted to see that this just this past week, Jukebox added another entry into that mythos with a new story titled Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Now, excuse me, I think I said this week. It was This is actually from a couple weeks ago. This is from June 6th. This is with the June 6th update on the archive. Anyway, the story is Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. It's just south of 6,000 words, a bit longer than some of his other work. I think most of the time, it seems like his stories are in the three to 5,000 range. But in any case... This story is an excellent follow-up. We, we find out a little bit more about what might be happening behind the scenes with the girls, a little bit more about what their nature might be. But the particulars of the story, and I, I'm not really revealing too much here. This is a very minor spoiler I'm going to give you. But the particulars of the story are a, a police detective, a, a woman is investigating a series of robberies being committed by a gentleman who is using his girl, trademark, in the robberies in some fashion. Nobody quite understands why the girl is there because everybody knows that the sex toys are completely obedient to the, the customers who buy them, right? But in any case, this detective is, is trying to figure out how this gentleman is pulling off this string of jewelry store heists, why he's using a sex toy in the commission of these robberies, and she develops she develops a very wild, insane theory that's too bizarre for anyone to even contemplate. And I'll I'll stop there. I'll zip my mouth because you really ought to go read the story. It's very, very neat. There's some exceptionally hot moments that occur and I won't tease you anymore because I hope you'll go and read it for yourself. It's very, very good stuff. Jukebox is back after a bit of a hiatus on the archive. He's been back with new stories, seems almost every week for a month now. And he does now include a link. He has set up a Patreon account for himself, which you're, if you're unfamiliar, Patreon is a website kind of for crowdfunding, but the idea is that if there is someone out there in the world who is creating content that you like, you can become a, a patron of theirs through Patreon. You can donate money to them one time or on a regular basis, so much per month, that kind of thing, to just help support that artist and their work. And Jukebox has set up a Patreon for himself. He has uh, a note at the end of his story just saying that if you like his work, Please think about going to his Patreon and donating just a little bit of money. It'll help make sure that he keeps writing every single week and creating wonderful new content for the Erotic Mind Control Story Archive. You can find him on Patreon at patreon.com slash jukebox, J-U-K-E-B-O-X. So that is my reading recommendation for this week to go check out this great story by Jukebox and let me know if you enjoy it as much as I did. Now, another thing I want to come back to, this is something I've mentioned, I know, on every episode of the show so far, but that's because it's really good. But I want to talk just a little bit about Uzabono once again. Now, last episode, I went into Uzabono and Tabaco's collaborative comic series, Core, 
The latest issue, Core 8, I did a big breakdown, talked about what I enjoyed about it, some of the themes and things that I was uh, really enjoying in this recent episode. I want to let you know that Uzabono has put a new post on her DeviantArt page in which she is giving all of you an opportunity to get early access to the next issue of Core, Core issue number nine. And what it involves is filling out a questionnaire, giving her and Tabaco some detailed feedback on the series, on Core issue number eight, what you liked about it, what things stick out to you. They have a couple of very specific questions that they ask you to answer. But if you take the time to fill out this questionnaire, fill out this survey, give them your detailed feedback on core number eight, then you are going to get the opportunity to check out core number nine before anybody else. And I think that is a really exciting prospect because I'm a big, big fan. And if I can get my hands on that comic even a few days early, bet your ass I'm going to do it. So if you are like me and interested in taking advantage of this very generous offer, then you can head on over to Ozobono's Deviant Art page, which is U-Z-O-B-O-N-O dot DeviantArt.com. And it's her most recent post in her activity feed. You can check it out. It's dated June 5th, 2015. And it's got all of the pertinent information that you'll need to take advantage of that deal. And I just want to say thanks very much to both of them because that's rad. That's just rad. I'm so happy. Let's talk a little bit about some new stuff from yours truly. I am very happy to report that I finally have got a, a, new, a new piece, a new animation up on my website, the first of 2015, and it is called Defeat. This is actually a piece that I have had finished, or at least I've had the artwork finished. I've had all of the visual stuff, the animation, and so forth. All of that's been done for some time now. But I really had not yet had any inspiration as far as a story goes. And so recently, I went through, I've got maybe three or four finished pieces right now that I'm trying to write for. And I went back recently and took another look at this and finally figured out what I wanted to say with it. And so I sat down and, and I wrote uh, the caption for this, this new animation. The image itself, w the first time I saw it, I, I just it was one of those moments where I kind of sat staring at the screen with my mouth hanging open. Number one, because it's, it's hot. But number two, because I could just see vividly in my mind. I could just vividly see exactly what I wanted to do with it immediately. And I don't know if describing it is going to do you any good at all, but just in case you get something out of the experience, I'm going to go for it. What's happening in the scene is it's a close-up of a, a blonde model who is in repose. She's, she's lying back. We can't quite see what she's lying on. But she is wearing this kind of collar or harness around her neck with this big O-ring in front. And there's another woman poised over her. And she's in the act of rubbing her breasts over this blonde's face. And the blonde's mouth is just hanging open and a nipple is being pushed into it. And she has the most abject look of ecstasy in my mind on her face that I've ever seen. It, at least to me it does. And I saw this image and she you can only see one of her eyes because the rest of her face is covered in cleavage. But the one eye is just staring up, staring straight up. And I looked at this image and I said, the only thing that would be hotter than what I'm already seeing is if there was some sort of swinging jewel or something like that above her eye and that would just make this perfect. So I added that a long time ago, and I actually did this little trick with the animation. I, I tried to do this pseudo 3D trick. So as opposed to the, looking like the jewel is just going back and forth, it actually sort of looks like it's spinning around, and I, I had a lot of fun playing with that. 
But in any case, I just recently finished the text for this, and I think it's I think it's pretty I think it's pretty spicy. I, I was really happy when I got to the end of it. I hope that all of you will be as well. I haven't I haven't really advertised it all that much. I haven't put it out on social media or made any kind of posts about it. But I will be doing that very soon. So if you want to go and check out my latest work, that is Defeat, which is available in my gallery at calidus-mc.com. The reason that I haven't been all that active with new work is because I've been active behind the scenes, kind of catching up on work. As I detailed in one of the last shows, I had to go through this, this big thing with my website and had to create a new theme for my site that would be mobile compatible. And that took a lot of time. As a result of doing that, I also felt the, the need to go ahead and update most of the animations on my site to also be mobile compatible. Most of them were not. Starting in, I think, 2014, maybe, maybe earlier, but I, I believe 2013, 2014, I started making my manips as opposed to making them flash animations it occurred to me that it would be really, really easy to just make them videos, to just make them short little videos that would loop when they played. They were a lot smaller. Some of my flash animations are 100 megabytes or more, which is really excessive. It's really, really excessive considering what it is you're actually seeing on screen. And it just occurred to me that it was a little ridiculous, as opposed to an H.264 mp4 file that's 265k or something like that it, it, the comparison is just not even not even worth mentioning even though i just did damn it anyway the point is that i went back through my catalog and took all of the old animations that were flash based and i've converted those now to modern web video animations so those will all play fine in your browsers, on your mobile devices. You don't have to have Flash. You don't have to sit there and wait for it to download for 30 or 40 seconds that you load up almost instantly, and the quality's really, really good. And I've also included still images in most of those cases, so if you just want to grab the JPEG and have that or whatever, you can. Now, for the single animations, for an animation that's just one image on a loop, no problem. And all, and all of those are updated at this point, going back to, to my very first one. However, I have done a couple of series. Off the top of my head, the three that I'm thinking of are Kia and Ka, which was the second Ka hypnosis pick, or in this case, it was a series that I did. The second is Alpha, and then I've done Nickelodeon, and there might be another one that I'm not thinking of, but those are the only ones I can think of off the top of my head that are, it's like a gallery, it's like a, a series of images and some of them are animated. Some of them are, but some of them are animated. So those are a little bit more complicated. And so I started working a couple of weeks ago on a test project to see if I could reproduce the effect of that flash animation using nothing but web video HTML5, and a little bit of JavaScript. But the point is things that would be compatible with modern web browsers and modern mobile devices. That, that was my goal, is to have these things work on mobile devices. And it has taken almost two weeks of, of quite a bit of effort on a, on a daily basis for a couple of weeks. I have been working at this and working at this and working at this, and finally... Late last week, I cracked it. I finally figured out a methodology and a workflow that will not only allow me to do this, but allow me to do it in a relatively rapid way, which putting the Flash projects together was a bit time consuming. And so I was determined to not only do this mobile compatible version of these animations, but also find a way of working for myself that would be efficient and that I wouldn't dread. And frankly, the reason I haven't done more projects like this is because it's such a pain in the ass to do. So I started with Kia and Ka because that one is the most complicated. It has the most moving parts 
as it, as it were. The other two are, are relatively simple by comparison. I started with that one because I figured it would be the most difficult, and it was. It was definitely a challenge. But eventually, I kind of checked off every feature I had on the list of things I wanted to accomplish and managed to find a workaround or some solution for every problem that I encountered. And I am about to upload that. It, it might not be up by the time you listen to this. I, I'm not sure if I'll have it up on the site, but at some point in the week or so following the release of this podcast, I'll have Kia and Ka updated to this new mobile compatible version in the browser. It'll be a great experience. You can just click next and back and listen to the music if you'd like to and all of the things that the original animation allowed you to do. But that should also work pretty well on mobile devices. Now, I will give you a caveat that I've not been able to test it on Android because I don't own an Android device. But I have been able to test it on both iPhone and iPad. And it works pretty well. It works better on iPad than it does on iPhone. It's a lot easier to read. The screen's much bigger, obviously. And some of the some of the effects that don't work on iPhone do work on iPad, like having video play underneath uh, a transparent layer, as an example. In any case, I'm very happy with how it's turned out. I think that it strikes a very good balance of usability across all platforms, as opposed to having to create a separate version for deployment on desktop web browsers, tablets, and then phones, I have one that actually works really well on all of those, I think. But I would really appreciate any feedback from you out there, especially if you have an Android device, tablet, phone, and you can let me know how the experience works for you. I would appreciate your thoughts on that. Uh, do a little bit of troubleshooting on it. And if there are any, if there are any really serious bugs that break the experience, I'll certainly try and address those if I'm able to. So anyway, that is the that is the big news on updates on my side. Of course, the next step now that I have this process figured out, the next step is to get the other animations that I've created, the other multi-part series animations get those converted over as well, and that is something I'll be working on in the not-too-distant future. Oh, I just thought of another one, The Room, that, that nip with Aria Giovanni in the, in the bondage chair. I forgot about that one. I like that one, too. That one's fun. So, at least a few more that I have to get updated before all of the animations on my site will be mobile compatible, but the day is coming very, very soon. And I'll be excited to share all of those with you once they are finished. Incidentally, if you are interested in web design or doing any of this kind of thing for yourself, the tool that I'm using to create these new animations is an HTML5 animation software called Hype for Mac. It's available on the Mac App Store. It's created by a company called Tumult. And I believe the current version is three. They have a personal version and a professional version. The professional version does have a few, it does have a few features that I thought were important enough that I went ahead and sprang for the upgrade. But if you're in, if you're on Mac and if you have any interest in doing that kind of work for yourself, you might want to give it a look. It, uh, it it's been very very handy. They do updates that add features on a pretty regular basis. I found it to be a good investment. So it might be something you want to think about getting if you're into creating animations yourself. All right. Next thing I want to talk about is a happy little chain of events that played out recently on Tumblr. I got a notification that I had been tagged in someone's post recently, and so I go and look to see what this is all about. And I find this, this lengthy caption attached to a photo and the photo is of this delightful young woman who is kneeling on a bed, knees spread wide, impaling herself on this large black sex toy and looking quite dreamy over the whole thing. And the caption that follows is very hot and it's very clever and it plays out as though it is a lengthy set of disclosures, warnings, and directions 
on how to properly use a topical solution called topical hypnotic. And topical hypnotic, as you might surmise, has some interesting effects. And I don't want to spoil anything else about what's written, but it's really, really hot. It was created by a member of Tumblr called The Sleepless Doctor, who you can find at sleepless, D-O-K-T-O-R, dot Tumblr, dot com. And it's a really, really great caption. It's a great photo to go along with the caption. And what's interesting is that apparently the company who puts out this product is the Impera company. And somebody had, had read this terrific caption and said, oh, I for a second I read Impera and thought you meant Impero. And hey, didn't, didn't Calidus used to do some stuff with Impero? Is, is that where it all started? And somebody had tagged me and said, yeah, I think it was Calidus, but you'd have to go and ask him. So anyway, I just replied and said, yeah, I created the Impero Clinic and all that mythos, and you can find it here on my website, and blah, blah, blah. But uh, at, at one point, the sleepless doctor chimed in and, and said, oh, yeah, I was totally thinking of that. It was kind of a riff on the Impero Clinic and all that stuff. So anyway, it was just a neat little exchange between people in the community and all derived from this really, really terrific image and caption, which you should definitely go check out. I'll have that in the show notes, believe me. So you should uh, do yourself a favor and give it a look, give it a read. I don't think you'll be disappointed by that. And it's really nice to know that people like the Imperial Clinic mythos. It's something I'm very fond of. I had a lot of fun putting it together. I haven't really done much with it in a while, although there is a there is a little bit of an Easter egg that points to the Imperial Institute in decisive results. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a combination. It's a combination Easter egg that simultaneously points to the Impero Clinic and also a, a Tabaco reference. Nobody's ever, people have messaged me about Easter eggs and there are a few, there are a few Easter eggs in decisive results. People have messaged me over the years about a few of them, but no one's ever mentioned this one that I'm talking about in particular. If anyone, if anyone spots it, if anyone spots this, uh, this combo Easter egg I'm talking about and correctly deduces what I'm referencing, uh, there will be a prize involved. I, I don't know what the prize will be, but I'll, I'll, I'll definitely mention your name on the podcast and, and maybe there'll be other goodies too. But anyway, uh, I dig the Imperial Mythos, and I know that I haven't visited that recently, but it is definitely something that I am planning to do more with in the future. And I suppose I could leave that there and tease you like the horrible person that I am, but I'll go on to say that several scripts that I've worked on that I would very, very much like to make into erotic fetish films, several scripts deal with the Imperial Clinic and goings on there. So if you like the Imperial Mythos, fear not. If I have my way, there will be lots more to explore in the hopefully not too distant future. As I said in the very first episode of the Black Room podcast, I always had hoped and intended that I would be able to have guests on the show, interview artists, writers, people who create some of the amazing things that we in the erotic mind control community appreciate and devour with, with so much intensity and enthusiasm. And I'm very happy to announce that today we're having our first guest on the show. And I suppose it's probably not a big surprise to those of you who follow either my blog or her blog, because all of you will of course know that she and I are good friends. She's a very, very talented author, a prolific blogger, and I'm proud to say my good friend. Please welcome to the podcast, A. Regina Cantatus, otherwise known as Thrall. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm blushing now. Already? <laughs> yeah, already. <laughs> but I've been looking forward to this for to this for a long time, and I'm just as excited as you are to be on your podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, 
it's really, I mean, obviously we, we talk in email constantly, mm-hmm. but it is rare that we have the chance to, uh, to chat on the phone or anything of the like. And we always do have such fun conversations. And I have to imagine that, uh, that people will, will glean something from that. Mm-hmm. None the least of which is the origin of, of your name. And why don't you talk about that a little bit and how, how you, how you ended up selecting the, the author's pseudonym, A. Regina Cantatus. Okay. Well, first of all, I didn't think that Thrall by itself would make much of an author title. I wanted right. something that sounded at least sort of like a real person's name. And I decided that I would try to find something in another language that said more or less the Queen's Thrall because my full former nickname was the Queen's Thrall. So I used Google um, Translate, and I ran a few things through in Latin, and I... Big fan of Latin myself, (laughs) as you may or may not be aware. (laughs) (laughs) So I I ran a few things through Google Translate, and I was trying to get something that said enthralled by the Queen or something along those lines. And after messing around for about five minutes, I came up with A. Regina Cantatus, which at the time I thought meant by the queen enthralled. Um, actually, though, this is the funny part you don't know yet. When oh. Yeah, surprise here. When I went back later and tried again on a different day and Google had reset itself, cantatus came out instead of meaning enthralled to mean something like chanting or singing. So I guess that would be by the queen made to sing. <laughs> That's interesting, although it's it's still not entirely inappropriate, though. I suppose not, although you don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other alternative that I considered was Regina E. Mancipian, because Regina E. would be Regina I in Latin, which means the queens, and then Mancipium is thrall or slave, but... I thought Cantatus sounded like a more legitimate last name, so I just went with it. I figured he'd notice. But the funny thing is, now I get people on Facebook calling me Regina, and they don't ever realize I am not Regina. I am not the queen. But right, I just Regina's the queen. It. It's open to, as you know, as I always talk about with the, the various pronunciations that, and, and I actually have been asked a number of times over the years how I pronounce my name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, it's like I always say, you know, like once you put it out there into the world, People are basically going to make it their own. Yeah, yeah. And, but um, and actually, um, uh, just a note to people listening to this: when I first got on the phone with you this evening, I actually called you Colitis, even though I know good and well it's Calitis. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all right. I think I think I said in the very first podcast that uh, you know if, if you if you pronounce it differently than I do, that's okay. I mean, it's it's a dead language, so we're all yeah. just speculating at some point anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I used to, I I did something very similar, not necessarily with with my pseudonym. Mm-hmm. That that came about differently. But the first version of my of my website, the the uh, subtitle of the site was Mentis Temporo Proficio, mm-hmm. or 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 something to something to that effect. I'm having trouble recalling now, but it. It loosely translated as mind control art. Huh. Oh, I like that. And I, I, I had that for the longest time, and I, I can't remember exactly why I changed. I think I just changed it for just for the sake of clarity. Yeah. Um. But I, I, I and and because I, I used to always remember that I would get my own. Like if you sign up for the email newsletter on my website, mm-hmm. this the subject line or the from the from would be. From Mentis Tempuro Proficio, mm-hmm. and then the subject line would be, "Well, I'm back again." And I remember getting a couple of those in my inbox and being like, "I don't know what the hell this means. How would <laughs> would anybody else have any chance?" Yeah, really. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of the speaking of your your author title, you, you mentioned that you thought it it sounded like a more real author name, A. Regina Cantatus. And I agree that there, there's a, a delightful meter to that, that phrase. But obviously, the, what portended the adoption of that, that pseudonym was you moving from being a, or an author within the erotic mind control community who, had you, had you p- published your work anywhere else? I say published. Had you released your work 
anywhere else other than the erotic mind control story archive? Yeah, and I specifically mean your mind control work. Okay, no, I had not. It was all just going straight to the EMCSA. So what pretended that the name adoption was you moving into the world of e-publishing and, right. and creating e-books, in, in most cases that were... They were direct adaptations, although I got the impression that you had gone back in some cases and polished uh, s some of your older things uh, a little yeah, bit. I, I polished them all a lot. Oh, really? A lot. Uh -huh. I'm going through a similar uh, a similar situation myself, uh, which maybe we can get back to. But I, mm -hmm. I, I, I suddenly find myself faced with the George Lucas dilemma of... Mm -hmm suddenly now having the ability to do what I had intended to do a long time ago and debating with myself as to whether or not to change things. But I'm imagining, I'm imagining some variation, some EMC variation of Han shot first. Yes, I, I, I worry about it. Not that I'm trying to compare my work to Star Wars, but... Yeah, no, I'm just imagining people complaining at you for changing something they love. I wonder about that, though. I, I really do. I, I, I look at the image and I say, oh, I could do this much better. And then I think, yeah, but what if I'm changing something that someone, like, oh, that was my favorite part is the, the way the little <laughs> whatever flashed or whatnot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But anyway, back to you. <laughs> Talk a little bit. I, I, I would like to hear the, the story about how did you initially get interested in the idea of e-publishing your fiction, and mm -hmm. w w was there sort of a eureka moment where you decided to do it, or was it something that you'd been creeping up on for a long time? I'll be honest. It was my blog commenters. Uh, for a long time, I, I had shared with just a few people in my real-life world that I wrote erotica, and some of them would suggest I get into e-publishing. And I just had this idea, and I don't even know where it came from anymore, is that you just couldn't make any money off of it. And maybe for a long time you couldn't. But it was somewhere in the middle of publishing Sleepwalkers on the Mind Control Story Archive yes. that some of my blog commenters started to tell me, no, you really should publish this. You really can make money. And that was the first time I started to take it seriously. So then I went on over to the MC Forum's e-publishing forum mm -hmm. and uh, started reading about how to do it. And this is a good chance for me to put in a plug for that forum for anybody else that's thinking about e-publishing, because there is an excellent post pinned right to the top of that forum, and it's called Summary Slash FAQ of Self-Publishing. And if you're thinking about publishing, that is absolutely the place to start. And that's where I started, and that's where I figured out I really could make some money. In, in brief, I know that one of the... I know that, that one of the hurdles that probably a lot of people have in mm -hmm. in trying to uh, trying to set up some sort of some sort of business arrangement around their work mm -hmm. is anonymity and yeah. and that that's a that's a major concern I imagine for a lot of people. Can you speak to that just a little bit? W were you able to find a a solution that satisfied you a, a, as far as protecting your anonymity? Well, I think um, I'm basically just trusting to Amazon and Smashwords to do what they say they're going to do. Right. Uh, they say that, well, you do have to provide them tax information and so forth because yeah. they do report your earnings. So, uh, But they also say they're going to keep that information private, so I'm basically trusting them to do that. Um, beyond that, uh, I try really hard not to get my different persona I crossed. You know, I'm, I'm thrall to some people, yeah. uh, to other people. I have a different name. Um, I have a, two or three different identities online, and I work really hard to keep them all separate because I don't want this stuff to leak over. But at the same time, because I'm realistic and kind of pessimistic, I have uh, worked out all kinds of worst-case scenarios in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if a day ever comes when somebody comes knocking on my door and says, hey, I know who you are, you're that sleazy, lesbian, fetish porn writer. <laughs> well, yeah. We should all be so lucky it. to get that visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just kind of prepared for anything and hoping for the best. Well, uh, that's, pro that's probably good life, good <laughs> life advice right there. In general, to most situations, that's probably a, a decent strategy. Yeah, I guess it is. I, 
want to talk a little bit about one one of the things about your ebooks that mm-hmm. I am especially interested in mm-hmm. is the cover artwork mm-hmm. that <laughs> that you've been doing, and I, I'm looking at a few right now on on uh-huh. Google, and uh-huh. the progression of I, I think now cor- and correct me if I'm wrong here mm-hmm. was the first was the first cover that you designed yourself the one for Sleepwalkers. No, um, actually, the first one I designed is uh, not even visible anymore because it was just so bad that I replaced it. The first book I published was Love in a Silver Socket, yes. and I chose that one to go first because I figured it was fairly mainstream, and it also wasn't going to be a bestseller. I didn't want to put my potential bestseller out there first in case I screwed everything up. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, so uh, Love in the Silver Socket never has sold well. I came up with a better cover later, but never did get a great one for that one. But you've yeah. done some amazing covers in the, t- in the time that, that you have been doing this and, and watching the progression and how sophisticated uh, you've gotten, both with your technique and you use, correct me if I'm wrong again, but you use GIMP, the, yes. the, the open source photo editor, right? Right, right. The sophistication of your technique... And but particularly your your sensibilities as relates to design mm-hmm. is been really really fascinating to to watch the evolution of that and some of these <laughs> has evolved. some of these covers are really really good and the thing that I am always struck by is mm-hmm. how legitimate they seem in terms of what you would imagine a an, an erotic novel would have I, I mean I could literally picture some of these covers. If I, you know, walked into a bookstore and and walked, uh, you know, walked past maybe the sci-fi section or, mm-hmm. uh, or the like, what are the uh, like like the trashy soccer mom romance <laughs> novels? Not that not that your stories are trashy soccer mom novels, yeah, but <laughs> but the covers have a lot of a lot of similarities to mainstream book covers that I've I've seen in bookstores, and I'm always struck by by that quality that, that you really have been able to produce for yourself some excellent, excellent cover work. Well, thank you. I, I had to work a long time to get to that point. And, you know, because you were there from the beginning <laughs> and uh, I need to give total props to you for that cover for Willing Subject. For anybody listening to this that doesn't know who did the artwork for that book, that was Calidus. And I tell you, to this day, that book is still bringing in sales more consistently than almost any other book I have out there. That's amazing. <laughs> and I swear that's due to your artwork. You, you know, the, the the thing about that that I find, uh, well, if, and first, thank you very much. That, that's exceptionally gracious of you to say. But I, I'm looking right now on Google Image on Google image search results at mm-hmm. all these covers. And I see, I see mine in there. The mm-hmm. thing that is remarkable to me is that I like mine the least. And <laughs> I think that the reason I like mine the least is because to me, it looks the least like a book cover. All of your others look like book covers to me. They have the titles very, very large, the author credit, mm-hmm. very, very large, exactly like you would expect on a book. Mm-hmm. And mine the the title and the author are very very small tucked away in the corner and you can totally see the difference in in like like what was important to us like what was important to me was you know th- this image that that I had been working on and what's important to and you almost totally naked woman That's exactly what's yes, <laughs> what I thought and what's important to you is the title and 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 the author and it, it's fascinating to see how stark that difference is. Mm. Between the one that, that that I did for you, I, I look at it mm-hmm. now and I'm like, yeah, I wasn't designing a book cover. I was I was basically putting a caption on a photograph. <laughs> but no, you did it. I mean, that is what I found out that you need to go for with these book covers. And it took me a long time to find that out. If you look at the covers I did for things like Octopus Vulgaris, I'm looking at that and, now, and it's awesome. And Union, <laughs> no, no, it's terrible. <laughs> I just I don't dare change it at this point because Amazon has gotten so much stricter about what they're cracking down on, and if I bring any attention to that cover, somebody's going to chunk the book out because it's hentai. So I've got to let that one but go. The, that, that's the thing that's <laughs> the, the thing that's great about <laughs> it is how it, it 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 is it is subtle and yet not subtle. 
Yeah, that, that tentacle's going right at that girl's, yeah. It's going uh-huh. right up her pant leg. <laughs> and I don't dare let Amazon take another look at it. No, you don't want but to do that. I could, but I could do such a better cover now. Uh, or if you look at Union Reunion, that's another one where I thought I had this great idea of using Botticelli's Venus in a different context yes. and throwing in more tentacles. Uh-uh. You know, neither one of those books is selling anymore. Hot to Pistol Garris did sell well at first. I'll give it that. But it's a good story, too. Learned... What? <laughs> well, that's a good story, too. Thank you. Thank you. I was really proud of it. Oh, yeah. I was, I was especially proud of turning such an obvious phallic symbol as a tentacle into <laughs> a symbol of feminine power. Right. Uh, I was really proud of that and, of course, all the Lovecraft uh, references. Yeah, well, you and I are both big fans. Big oh, fans yeah. of Lovecraft. I can't imagine what he'd think, though, if he knew what I'd done with his stories. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, would, he, would be, he would be mortified that members of the lowly rank-and-file class had anything to do with his mythology. He would be... <laughs> <laughs> not, not to mention I've turned Innsmouth into a fancy resort town and populated it with lesbians. <laughs> yes, no, he would not be down for that. Um <laughs> But uh, it, it, it is an interesting, just to, to go back for one second to what you were speaking to about the, the, the symbol of, of the tentacle being a symbol of female power, that in and of itself mm-hmm. is, is rather remarkable given the fact that in almost every representation, or at least formatively, I, I, think that, I think that as things have evolved that has changed, but certainly mm-hmm. the foundations for hentai erotica mm-hmm. is, is very much about female disempowerment. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And so it is a nice, it is it is a nice turnaround. Well, thank you. I I'm, I really intentionally did turn that around, and I'm always gratified when somebody notices what I did. Let's talk a little bit about about some of your because I find, and I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, but certainly in the art that I do, I find it very satisfying when I feel as though I have found the perfect image and married it with the perfect story. Mm. And I'm curious to know if you have a similar outlook. Do you find uh, do you find particular satisfaction in a story that you're quite proud of and marrying that with a cover that you feel is either very very good artwork or very representative? Well, not entirely, and I'll tell you the reason for that. It's because I'm such a perfectionist. Yes, um, I have had to figure out the hard way that you're never going to get the cover that perfectly right. fits your story. You just aren't. I spent one week or maybe two weeks doing one of the covers, one of the intermediate covers for Sleepwalkers, and I was just putting bits and pieces of things together in GIMP and trying so hard to create the image that matched what was in my head of what would be the right cover. And what I came out with looked horrible. Now, was, that, was that the image of the... <laughs> uh, I, I think I remember you showing me that. That was the image of, of the, 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 the male character in bondage and the, the female controller. Right. Uh, she, she's behind him, sort of reaching around, almost embracing right. him. Yeah, and it just looked so terrible. And I couldn't admit it to myself because I put so much work into it. I just couldn't bear the thought that it was anything less than wonderful, except it just looked horrible and it didn't sell. And at that point, I realized I really needed to get some help with covers. And I really do want to give some shout-outs to some people that helped me because the reason I'm doing good covers now is partly because of you helping me understand what was important, partly because of Jacqueline Sweet, who did the cover that's out on Sleepwalkers Now. Which is phenomenal. It's really good. Jacqueline Sweet really knows how to do a cover. And um, if if anybody listening hasn't checked into her stuff now or not yet, do check it out because she's a fantastic writer. She does some of her stuff is just kinky bondage stuff. Some of it's mind control. She is a member of the erotic mind control fetish community, so you'll find all kinds of good stuff to enjoy in her stuff. She she gets into weird uh, kinky supernatural shit, and you know, yes. it's wonderful. So she. Yeah, she did that cover for me. I noticed how good her own covers were in Esther, if I could hire her to do one for me, and she did, and it's phenomenal. And the other group that I want to give credit to for helping me figure out how to do good covers is the Facebook group that I'm a part of, and they're called the One-Handed Writers Group. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, great name. Yeah. And 
almost all of them are writing fairly mainstream erotica. Some of them are, you know, kinky. There's there's apparently a really big market for shifter erotica, and a lot of them write that. Um, and we, you know, we talk about all kind of different things. And I've started throwing my covers out there to them. I say, here's a rough draft. Tell me what you think. And every time I've done that, they have just given mm-hmm. me such wonderful feedback. Um, I'll tell you the. If you had seen the first version of Hoarder, that's my story yes. about uh, basically dragon sex. If you if you had seen the original version I did, which I thought looked great, um, and then you compare it to what I came out with after they worked on it for me, I mean it's just like comparing mud. It, it, tur- to the Mona it turned Lisa. out a fantastic cover. I mean, yeah. it, it's 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 got a very strong, uh, very strong visual image with the with the female model that you have posing. But it's got all of the things that Mm -hmm. I look for in in book covers, which is subtlety, you know, things going on in the background. And in this case, you have, you know, the silhouette of the dragon on the cave wall. And it's fantastic. It's it's a really, Mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. well put together cover. So that's 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 excellent to hear, because whatever whatever suggestions they're giving you, whatever whatever critique they're handing you is really paying off. It really is, and they also gave me tons of, of feedback on what happens in VCon, including helping me to change the name, which right. was originally If Wishes Were Horses, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, um, you know, anyway, what happens in VCon is much better. It, it, it is. It, it's, it's very evocative. It, 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 it's one of those titles that immediately, that immediately invites you to begin, it, it, begin answering the question with your imagination. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know what does this mean? What does this lead to? And it, it's 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 really good. It, it's very evocative. I think it it kind of gets the reader's imagination involved almost immediately. Yeah, and you know I, when I originally gave it that title about horses, I was thinking about the Trojan horse because there are so many little hidden references in there to the Iliad. But I have to back up and remind myself that most readers probably don't care about that and won't even notice those references. So you know why. Why throw out a <laughs> reference to the Iliad in the title? You know, that's me getting too English teachery. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it, now, I, now I like to think that I'm just dropping Easter eggs in the story for people that can find them. And if they don't find them, they're not missing out on anything. That, that, that's probably a good attitude to have about it. But it does raise an interesting question, which is, mm-hmm. of course, the, the balance between satisfying yourself mm-hmm. in, 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 your, in your art mm-hmm. and also the the proposition of a of a business venture and doing something that you think's going to connect with your audience and yeah. I'm not yet in a position where I'm I'm doing anything as a business venture with my work but certainly I can think of times when I've been working on something writing something and thinking about you know trying to imagine how people are going to react to this and what what they might like to see and mm-hmm. as as much as i suppose some of us i don't particularly have this this opinion but i'm sure that there are some people who who are consider themselves artists mm-hmm. and say i'm doing this only to satisfy myself and if people like it that's great but if they don't they can fuck off right i I certainly don't have that opinion, I, I, and I just I wonder about do you, is that ever anything you think about? Is is there ever a, a balance act that, that that you have to a balancing act that that you have to play between satisfying your own your own impulses and, and also doing something that you think will be that people will connect with? Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, I I hear a lot of stories from other writers, some in the EMC field and some from this one handed writers group that are just making bundles of money because they're churning out stuff constantly. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're churning out the kind of stuff that people want to read, um, whether it's shifter romances or uh, within the EMC community, mostly the male-dominant stories or ones with incest. And I'm just not going there. I'm not right. writing that. I mean, well, I'm not going to say no to a shifter romance. I might do that sometimes. <laughs> <if I can laughs> <get rid of it. laughs> but you will not, I, I cannot bring myself to write certain things. And right. I realize that limits the amount of money I can make doing this. Right. And that's hard because, uh, believe it or not, I'm not rich. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I could definitely use a little more money in the bank each month. But Certainly. I can't bring myself to write anything I don't feel passionate about. I know exactly what you mean. 
Yeah. And and there are times when it there there are times I alternate between being frustrated by that mm-hmm. and also being comforted by that. But I, I have discovered in my life and I, I've tried to I've tried to take things take things on that were just for a paycheck and I absolutely can't mm-hmm. do it. Yeah. I can't I cannot bring myself to or or at least I can't do it well. And yeah. and perhaps that just is maybe that's the difference between a hobbyist and a professional, but I can only do things that I think are really representative of my talent yeah. when I'm emotionally invested in the outcome. And if I'm not, yeah. then I, I almost can't even get started. Yeah. And, you know, I think we'd better both say at this point that we're not trying to, to slag on the people that do put out stories constantly. No, certainly but, not. You know, more power to them. I admire them being able to churn out stories that quick because I write very slowly. Yes, that was yeah. exactly the point I was going to make. I, yeah. I really admire anybody who can summon their craft yeah. and and really harness their talent to do something that they themselves might not be as interested in. Right, right. Like, like I said, I mean, I would consider that the difference between a professional and a hobbyist. I think that a professional mm-hmm. does the work. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and then goes on to the, goes on to the next job and I, and I think a, a hobbyist who is more doing it for their own enjoyment mm-hmm. doesn't have that capacity. So if anything, yeah. I, I think that they're probably uh, more capable than than yeah. I am certainly. Yeah, you and I are the hobbyists. <laughs> it's kind of funny <laughs> to think of ourselves that way. <laughs> Up until now, it's you know, oh, I mean, well, I don't think it. Certainly, certainly, you have you you have taken that step at this point. Certainly, you have taken that step, and you have created a small business around uh, mm-hmm. your writing, and you know that's something that I am sort of in the process of doing it with with my films. I'm never gonna mm-hmm. I'm never gonna charge for my uh, uh, my my manip worker, and you know that's something that I mean that's something that I do because it's fun. That's something that mm-hmm. I do just to satisfy myself and I'm happy to share it with everybody else. That's never going to change. But, mm-hmm. uh, certainly as the film venture grows, that's, that's going to have to be supported by some sort of business model that allows it to, to right. grow and to, mm-hmm. to evolve. Yeah. It's a, it's a tricky balance. Before we move away entirely from talking about your ebook stuff, uh, let's let people know where they can find you and find your work if they're interested mm-hmm. in checking out some of your fantastic books. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, I am publishing mostly through Kindle Unlimited, which means that you should go to Amazon and look me up under A. Regina Cantatis. And I guess I should probably spell that, although I imagine you'll probably... Put it, yes, um, I'll have I'll have links in the show notes for this, okay. and I, I, anybody who's listening to this, you can find the the official show notes for the uh, for the episode at podcast dot mc dot Okay, thanks. All right, I won't bother to spell Cantatis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you can also, find links to everything we're talking about from there. <laughs> okay, cool. And also, um, just. As a special to anybody listening to this podcast, I have uh, created a couple of deals for you guys over on Smashwords, and I am not generally publishing on Smashwords anymore. That's smashwords.com, by the way. But for from now until July 10th, you can get a free copy of Willing Subject, which is the book that I wrote that Calidus did the cover for and Sleepwalkers, which is my epic novel, I like to think. Oh, yes, it's fantastic. <laughs> you can get free copies of either or both of them on Smashwords if you purchase over there and use the coupon codes that I'm about to give you now. So the coupon code for Willing Subject is V as in Victor, H as in Hugo, the number 6, the number 2, and Q as in, heck, I don't know what the Quebec. official... Quebec, thank you. Or Queen. <laughs> okay. All right. Queen makes more sense in my kind of days. Yes. All right. And for Sleepwalkers, the coupon code is Q as in Queen, A as in Alpha. Yep. Nine, five, and S as in Snake, which I know is probably not the proper code, but heck, who cares? So, <laughs> again, I'll, I'll send those to you later, and, and you can post them along with the show notes. So anybody Excellent. that wants a, a taste of my stuff for free, you've got a limited time offer there just for listening to the podcast. Well, thank you very much. This is amazing. It's like a real-life guest on a real-life podcast. This is fantastic. (laughs) 
and they get the prizes even though they haven't played the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's just look, we're just like the Oprah Book Club here, except with tentacles. That's that's really here's the only difference. You, here's a tentacle for you. Here's a mind for you. I'm sure there are people in the audience who are salivating for that very thing. <laughs> um. Let's talk a little bit about not 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 a book that you wrote, but a book that mm-hmm. you recommended to me, and a book mm-hmm. that we are both very very interested in. And mm-hmm. there's a couple of well, there's a couple of aspects of this that we'll talk about. But I want to talk a little bit about a novel, which is mm-hmm. the first in a trilogy by an author named Jeff Vandermeer. The title of the book is Annihilation, and it's part of the Southern Reach trilogy, and you recommended this book to me on the basis that you thought it would be you, you thought it would be up my alley, but that while it is not in and of itself erotica, mm-hmm. there are some amazing crossovers with our our fetish, mm-hmm. almost as if you took if if you if you think about adapting a science fiction based erotic mind control story and just taking all the erotic bits out, mm-hmm. you would basically have annihilation. <laughs> And actually, you know, if you're willing to analyze deeply enough, you could find a lot of sexual imagery hidden among some of the symbols. You're not wrong. I, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that you can read, and yeah. you, you don't have to reach out with your imagination very far yeah. to grasp some of those things. Yeah, you can basically take it as deep as you want to take it, or stay at the shallow end if you want to. Right. Yeah. Um, how, did you first, how did you first come across Annihilation? I think the first place I read about it was in an article on IO9, which mm-hmm. is a, it's a, basically it's part of the Gawker system, and it focuses on science fiction, and I visit there every day, at least once a day, and they had the first chapter online, and as soon as I started reading it, and I was reading words like Lovecraftian, and, and uh, just the descriptions of how wonderfully weird it was, I knew I just had to buy it. Yes. And I didn't even know at the time just how heavy it was going to rely on mind control and hypnosis and brainwashing. And yeah. I was just like an added bonus. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you telling me I get a cherry with the Sunday? This is amazing. <laughs> you pretty damn big cherry. <laughs> That's right. Um, you recommended the book to me. And I, I checked it out because I'm a, I'm a fiend for Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. And so when, when you mentioned that, that it had sort of Lovecraftian overtones and that there was a lot of hypnosis and things like that going on. It, it piqued my interest. And so I went and, mm-hmm. and got the novel. And I have to say that it is, I mean, it is remarkable how it's remarkable what a big fan of Lovecraft Jeff Vandermeer is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, th- there's so many things about it that are, th- that are really not not the details or, or the mythos, but certainly the structure of the book. It reminds me a lot of uh, At the Mountains of Madness in the sense yeah, that yeah. You're, you're talking about an expeditionary group who is mm-hmm. going into an area where they, they know that things have gone wrong. They know that people have died. They are mm-hmm. going in to piece things together as best they can. And then, of course... The the primary characters are going deeper into that mystery, uh, b- mm-hmm. both literally as well as uh, figuratively. Mm-hmm. They they're going uh, deeper into that that mysterious area, discovering marvels, otherworldly things that are mm-hmm. you know that that are best left unknown. All of those <laughs> kinds of things. I, I mean, really, the, the the structure of the book is is really all all those kinds of things that that I think of when I think about that great H.P. Lovecraft novella. Yeah, that's a good comparison, and I hadn't thought of it in particular with that in the Mountain of Madness, but uh, it's very clearly Lovecraftian. You've got this sense of creeping dread through yes. it all. But you know what I think is really unique to Vandermeer, and it actually almost put me off at first, was your first glimpse of Area X, this area where something strange has happened. It just seems almost like ordinary Florida swampland. You know, That's there's, exactly there's, what I thought of, too. There is nothing immediately off about it. I mean, the only thing that happens in the first few pages that's off is this wild pig comes running at the group and then turns aside. Wow, big deal. You know, but right. that's just that's just like a teeny little drop in the ocean of what's to come. Yes. <laughs> yeah. by, the, by the time they get to the end, they're praying to be attacked by a wild pig. 
<laughs> yeah, and and the funny thing is, I don't think you ever find out what was going on with that wild hog, you know. But uh, there there were intimations later. You can figure out what might have been going on. Yes, yes. There, there's and, certainly uh, there's certainly hints that you're kind of ooh, wait a minute, it could be this. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, and, and that's I, and, one of my favorite things about the book. And I've I've said this to you, and and I think I might have actually mentioned this on the last episode in, in reference to. Uh, issue number eight of Core. I mm-hmm. love things in stories that are left unsaid. I mm-hmm. love when an, an author shows you something and doesn't explain it entirely, but lets your imagination meet them halfway and mm-hmm. kind of infer your own your own deduction into it. I love that. And, and Vandermeer, mm-hmm. Ma- Vandermeer does that very, very well without mm-hmm. ever feeling like he's holding something back. Yeah, yeah. Although I really do wish I could pick his brain about some of the details. <laughs> I read an, an interview with him at some point where, oh gosh, I don't know if I should say this because this is a, no, okay, this isn't too big of a spoiler. I can say okay. this. Go ahead. Um, I will say that uh, there have been several previous editions, expeditions into Area X. Yes. Some of them never returned. Some of them turned, but the, the people were weird. Yes, okay. not quite and, themselves. And, and, yeah, not quite themselves. And then there were other cases where certain members returned and didn't. Okay, so I read this interview with Vandermeer where he said that he had it all worked out. He had this system in his mind that determined why such, such and such would happen to each character. That there was a rationale why character X would come back, why character Y would not come back, why character Z would have you know what happen to them. Yes. And damn it, he hasn't told us what his rationale is. So, and I want to know. <laughs> but that 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 is fascinating, but it it also it also kind of answers one of my questions mm-hmm. uh, about the book which I I found myself as as I was going through wondering if there was well, and I was specifically wondering about the story. Like, I was kind of asking myself in the context of the story, is mm-hmm. there an intelligence behind mm-hmm. what happens to these various characters, the different mm-hmm. ways that the different ways that it can go, mm-hmm. most of them horrible? <laughs> well, I could actually answer that one for you, but I know you haven't read the second and third books in the series. That's true, but that actually is a great segue in, in, into mm-hmm. this, which I can let you know that today, literally today, I got the the audio version of the second book, so I'm going to start oh. in on that very soon. Oh, awesome! Your jaw is going to drop when you hear the almost the first paragraph. Your jaw is going to drop because <laughs> Vandermeer drops this gigantic spoiler bomb right there at the very front of the story. <laughs> nice. And I I want to rub your face in it, but I can't because you <laughs> you just have to tell me after you read it. You have to soon. tell me just how far your jaw drops. All right, very very soon. <laughs> Yeah. But um, Annihilation is it? it I, I think it's a it's a great novel. I'm very interested in moving on to the books in the trilogy, and mm-hmm. it, it was it was a it was a reading recommendation that as as opposed to as opposed to reading it just so that we could talk about it. And, and I've, I've done that in the past. Mm-hmm. I've read books. I've watched movies purely for the ability to discuss them with with, with a friend or you know somebody who wanted to uh, to talk to me about it. Far from that, mm-hmm. it, it it turned me from, or it turned me into a fan of, of Vandermeer and this this series. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm very very anxious to see where things go from here. Oh, you're gonna love it. There is so much more blatant mind control in the second right. book. Right. I mean, it's just you know there there are bits of it sneaking out in the first book, but it's right out in the open in the second. And then there's that scene I told you that's gonna make your hair stand yeah, on end. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll yeah. take it and keep taking it. Um, we should also mention. I, th- I think that we would be. I think we would be remiss to not mention to the mm-hmm. audience that in in our emails back and forth, we've talked for a while because inevitably they're going to adapt this this book or series of books into into films. And yeah. there's already movement. There's already some early work being laid for Annihilation to be adapted into a film. And you and I were mm-hmm. were kind of. Uh, fantasy casting the movie and talking about mm-hmm. different actresses that we thought should play the lead role, which uh, you know the character simply as the biologist. Mm-hmm. And we threw out a lot of names, people that we thought 
would be really, really good for the part, like, like just actresses that would be especially well suited. But one name that, that we did not mention in connection with this is Natalie Portman, who very recently was rumored to be in talks to play the, the lead character. And I think we both agree that she would be fantastic. Yeah. We had actually been previously talking about how somebody should give her a superhero role. Yes, yes. Because she would make a great superhero, and she's clearly got an interest, or maybe she's just been pigeonholed, but she's clearly got an interest in this sort of, of work. And I think she will be great as the biologist, because the biologist is, first of all, she's extremely smart, but she's also, frankly, very weird. Yes. She, she uh, is very much a loner. She doesn't really trust the others. She's actually not a very good biologist. This is flatly stated. She's not a very good biologist. Mm -hmm. And yet she is the protagonist of this whole story, and it's her point of view that we follow. She's the one narrating all the action. And Natalie Portman is, is the kind of person that you could buy as being that sort of smart but weird person who doesn't fit in. I agree. Yeah. And I will also say without any embarrassment or shame whatsoever, that I'm going to be very, very excited to see Natalie Portman's trance face at some point <laughs> in this film. I will, I, will also, I will also say that. Yes, she's a fantastic <laughs> actress. It's going to be really hot to see her drop into trance. And it's going to happen. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You know, and I, I, I wonder... Go ahead. I wonder who else we'll see dropping into trance alongside her. I don't know, but uh, there's... You know the scene I mean. Uh, I do. I know exactly the scene you mean. <laughs> and there's going to be... There's going to be some interesting... There's going to be some interesting things afoot. Yeah. We yeah. should try to go see that. If When that movie comes out, we should try to go see that together. If we're still... Oh, right. If we're still living as, as close as we are now, we, uh -huh. ought to, we ought to do a road trip and oh, yeah. go see that film together. That'd be fun. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, then we'll uh, make a, some sort of uh, report about that afterwards. I agree. A dual review. We, 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 yeah. could, we could do another podcast episode and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about yes. the movie. Yes, yes. Something else that we're going to do together, mm -hmm. we think, we've had a long gestating project, mm -hmm. a, long, a long talked about, oft threatened collaboration. <laughs> and we've got a big chunk of it mapped out, but we've not yet, we've not yet pulled the trigger on it. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, that's something that will change yeah. in the not too distant future. We'll come back to this. But do you, do you want to tease this just a little bit? Okay. All right. Um, well, let's see. I don't know how much I should say without going over the line. But uh, let me start by saying that when you did those collaborations with Tavico, yes, I was always jealous. <laughs> 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 she was getting to collaborate with you and I wasn't. Well, thank so, you. That's very uh, nice of you to say. <laughs> so at some point, one or the other of us mentioned to the other that uh, wouldn't it be cool if we collaborated? Yeah, we I don't do even something. remember whose idea it was. But, uh, I don't either. So we start... Sorry? I don't, I don't either now. Oh, okay. Well, it's I guess it doesn't really matter. We just sort of bounced ideas off of each other and came up with the idea of trying to create a story that fit in with Tabaco and Yago's Middle Earth series. Earth with a U. Earth with a U, right. Yes, thank you. And we wanted to make sure that uh, we wouldn't step on their toes, and we did contact them and make sure it would be all right. And uh, we came up with a plot that happens in a part of the world that is totally separate from the part that their characters yes, are. With the, the the dark queen and and that that greater sort of political furor that's right. that drives most of those stories. Yeah. So if this gets off the ground, and boy, I want it to get off the ground, and I know you do too. Yes. Um, it's it's going to take place in a little backwater, which is a very interesting backwater. Indeed, it is. <laughs> very interesting things happen in the water. As it turns <laughs> how's out, that for, how's that for a teaser? <laughs> that's a great teaser. I think that the, the, okay, there's a couple of things that are interesting uh, and unique about this for me. Mm -hmm. Number one, it is it's remarkable how much of the how much of the the concept and the story we we had mapped out almost immediately as yeah. soon as soon as we started talking about it. We were really on the same page in terms of 
what it should feel like and what it should look like and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The challenge is that it, the, the process has been almost completely backwards from how I normally approach things, which is to say that we have an idea and we are looking for images to bring that idea to life, to interpret that story. Mm -hmm. And in almost every instance of all of my work, it's always the opposite. It's always, I, I see the image and then I put the idea with it. Mm, and so this yeah. is, this is challenging on that level. It, it's challenging because the ideas that we have are fairly specific. Mm -hmm. And so finding the raw material to assemble all those, those pieces yeah. in, in, into the, the specific things that, that we need to accomplish, that's mm -hmm. the challenge. But, uh, you mentioned something recently that mm -hmm. I'm hoping is going to, uh, I'm hoping that it's, it's going to be uh, a big help to us in accomplishing that because I know that both of us really want to, we really want to see this idea come to fruition. Yeah, we just had so much fun putting it together. Oh, it was. The it was thought, fantastic. The thought that it's just sitting there in our minds and not going anywhere is kind of driving me crazy. <laughs> I know how you yeah, feel. Yeah, and I like to share my stuff so much. I guess you probably feel the same way. I do, yeah. I, I think that the, the the joy is in the joy it, really for me is is in putting it out there and knowing that it stirs something in people knowing that it connects mm -hmm. with people knowing that that you've you've hit a nerve with them that you know that you've you've done something that is really really connected to to uh you know whatever it is that 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 excites them about mind control or, you know, just, you know, kinky, naughty things mm -hmm. in general, but there's something yeah. deeply satisfying in that. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, it goes back to just the idea that on the internet, I can find people that I relate to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't find many people in real life that I relate to, but um, right. on the internet, I can reach out and touch somebody who thinks the way I do. And I kind of feel like they're reaching back and touching me or at least smiling at me. And, you know, when I hear feedback from them, and hear how much they like it. It just there's a connection. Yeah, it's, it's hard to describe, but it just feels great. It does. It, it's it's very very satisfying to to know that you have affected somebody in the positive. Yeah, yeah. and that I've got I don't know at least a little bit of a soul made out there somewhere. Right. Yeah. All right. I believe that we will leave things there for right now. I want to thank Thrall once again for coming on the show. It was a lot of fun to talk with her again, but the fun doesn't end here because the second part of our epic two-part interview is going to be coming out with the next episode of the Black Room Podcast, so be sure and tune in for that. We're going to be talking about a lot of movie-related things next time, including a marvelous mind control section where we'll discuss our thoughts on Avengers Age of Ultron and the Marvel television series Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Agent Carter and some of the interesting mind control things that have been happening there. We also discussed the viability of erotic mind control taking place within the Matrix universe and some other fun things as well. So be sure and come back for that conversation. And we would love to hear your thoughts if there's anything you'd like to chime in on something that we mentioned in this week's episode of the podcast or something that you'd like to bring to the table, please do so. You can find both of us on Facebook. I'm Calidus-MC, and she is A. Regina Cantatis. I'm on Twitter, at Calidus. And, of course, you can find me and leave a comment on the show at my website, which is podcast.calidus-mc.com. And we thank you very much. We look forward to hearing your thoughts as we hope you have enjoyed hearing ours. That is all for this episode of The Black Room. I'll be back next time. Until then, farewell.